Okay, everybody, welcome back to our Zoominar, and we're very happy to have today uh, Laura Starkston from UC Davis to tell us about unexpected fillings, singularities, and plane curve arrangements. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, and I just want to point out, so I'm going to be talking about joint work with Olga Planovskaya, and um, she's also giving a talk today on our joint work. Um, so if something I say doesn't make any sense, then you can go to her talk in a few hours. Um, and everything gets recorded. So um, we're gonna kind of tell the same story, but maybe try to focus on different details. Um, okay, so the topic that we're interested in is to study um, complex surface singularities. So we've got some kind of, um, you know, isolated singularity uh, cut out by polynomials, cut out somehow kind of analytically. Um, and it's got this, this isolated singular point and everywhere else we wanted to look like something of complex dimension two. Um, and so when we have such a singularity, one way to kind of capture some of the topology that's hidden by that singularity is um, to take this um, uh, surface in wherever it's in, embedded, some very large CN, and take a small ball that's surrounding the singular point. And um, the boundary of that ball is going to be a sphere, co-dimension one. And if I intersect this blue um, sphere with my black um, surface singularity, then I'm going to get a transverse intersection. So it will be a smooth manifold of real dimension three. So my, um, you know, com complex surface is real dimension four, and then I cut it down by one co-dimension. So I get this um, intersection, which is called the link of the singularity. So this is a, a three manifold. And from the contact, from the complex structure, I get a contact structure on the three manifold by looking at the complex tangencies to this link. So that's um, one piece of data. Uh, other ways that I can explore the kind of topology that's being hidden by the singular point are by trying to replace the singular object by something smooth. So um, there are various ways of doing that. Uh, one way is by looking at smoothings um, or sometimes called Milner fibers. And so the smoothing means I'm going to take the equations that cut out my singular surface and deform them a little bit until they become non-singular and they cut out a smooth manifold. And if I'm kind of focusing inside of a particular ball, I'm going to um, do those deformations small enough. Um, and then the link, the intersection with the sphere is um, not going to change in a noticeable way in, in the sense that it will be um, a contactomorphic three manifold with contactomorphic contact structure. So um, studying the smoothings is generally somewhat difficult to understand all of them if you have a general complex surface singularity. Um, another way that you can take something singular and turn it into something smooth is um, by doing a resolution. So with a resolution, um, instead of just deforming the equations in the ambient space you're in, you're going to blow up to change the ambient space and you keep blowing up however many times you need to until it becomes a normal crossing divisor. So if you're a topologist, then maybe you think of a normal crossing divisor as, as like a plumbing. Um, if you're an algebraic geometer, maybe you think of it as normal crossing divisor. Um, but these 
the for surface isolated surface singularities, um, there's a unique minimal normal crossing resolution. And so this is um, something that's well understood and it's kind of a good way to encode um, what singularity you're talking about um, because you can easily encode this kind of plumbing or normal crossing divisor by just keeping track of what are the components of this divisor. So each component I'll denote by a, a vertex and a graph. So each of these is some um, irreducible component of the divisor. And then um, each vertex, so each of these components, of course, is going to have some genus. And then I'm going to keep track so that it's a surface. Um, and so it's classified by each genus. And then I'm going to keep track of the normal Euler number or self-intersection number of um, of that piece. So for each vertex, I have a genus and a um, normal Euler number. And so I'll label each of the vertices like that. And then the edges indicate um, an intersection, a normal crossing intersection between um, the two components. So for every normal surface singularity, for every um, isolated surface singularity, I have one of these um, graphs, decorated graphs that, that encodes it. And you can kind of think of the singularity as basically taking the, um, this plumbing, um, the disk bundles, appropriate disk bundles over the appropriate surfaces, um, plumb together according to the edges, and then collapsing the core surfaces to a point. Okay, so these are two algebraic geometry ways to, to start with um, the singular object and replace it by something smooth. And then um, we can kind of go to the symplectic geometry range and generalize this. So the, the next option is to look at um, the symplectic fillings. So we um, have a contact-free manifold and um, both the smoothings and the resolution um, have that same contact boundary. Neither of them um, affects the, the link up to contact morphism. So uh, we can kind of generalize this by looking at what are all possible ways to find a symplectic manifold with convex boundary inducing that contact three manifold on the boundary. So, um, The kind of main question for the talk is, is how do we um, kind of compare the symplectic version with the algebraic geometry counterpart? So the smoothings and resolutions give examples of symplectic fillings, but maybe there are symplectic fillings which don't come from the algebraic geometric story. So this is our main question. Given a particular isolated complex surface singularity, um, does its link, that contact three manifold, have symplectic fillings which are different from the smoothing um, or the resolution? Um, so I'm being a little bit vague here about what different means. Um, there are different notions of um, equivalence. And so um, different could mean um, you know, not diffeomorphic or not symplectomorphic. And um, I'll get more precise um, when I actually state some answers to the question. Um, so this question was studied in particular families of um, well understood singularities. So some of the prior results um, looked at singularities in these classes. So uh, we have simple singularities, simple elliptic singularities, um, cyclic singularities, those are when the boundary is, a the link is a length space, um, and then quotient singularities, generalized cyclic singularities. Um, so these different kinds of singularities 
were studied. Um, and um, the, look, the, the authors look at their subjective feelings and try to understand them. So in these first two cases, um, Ota and Ono classified the symplectic feelings of these simple and simple elliptic singularities. And in this case, um, all the symplectic feelings are um, diffeomorphic and um, in fact, symplectic deformation equivalent to um, either uh, resolution or smoothing. In, th in these cases, they're just diffeomorphic to um, a resolution. And in the cyclic and quotient singularities case, um, in fact, the symplectic fillings, uh, there's more of a variety of them. It's not just the resolution, but um, you get either diffeomorphic to the resolution or a smoothing. So everything that's coming up um, in these situations, you could have already found that um, kind of filling just by looking at the algebraic geometric picture. Um, so I have, um, in these last two cases, there are kind of two results. The first one is basically like studying the fillings, this, like trying to understand some property or classification of the symplectic fillings of that three manifold. And then the second set of authors um, did the comparison between those um, symplectic fillings and the, um, and the smoothings. So that's a question. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, just namely, are these, are the, is there an example where you, you get sort of something that's, that's known to be neither? Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the question. Um, so the one example that we knew of in the past um, is, is the, um, was an example by Akhmadov and Osbachi where they looked at some um, non-rational examples where the, um, the resolution has kind of uh, some components of higher genus. And here what they found is that um, they constructed um, infinitely many fillings. And they had a property which ensured that none of them were smoothings. Um, which is that they have a uh, first body number greater than zero. So all of these um, smoothings or Milner fibers have um, trivial first body number. And so um, these, these ones were not smoothings. Um, one of them is the minimal resolution, but um, the infinitely many of them uh, the rest of them are, are not coming from algebraic geometry. So this was kind of the one example that we were aware of in the literature. Um, but because, um, so there's kind of this distinction of like the, most of the singularities that were looked at where they did seem to kind of coincide the symplectic and algebraic geometric world um, they have this property that these are rational singularities. Um, the, these ones are obviously elliptic. Um, so there, there's this kind of, you know, different notions of complexity of singularities. Rational is kind of like level zero, elliptic is level one, and then above that is kind of like the complicated ones. And um, these um, examples of Akhmadov and Ospachi, um are in the sort of complicated singularities class. So um, we were kind of wondering like, you know, where, where exactly is the, the line where um, you, you can find um, sing complicated, you know, maybe can you have a simpler singularity 
sim simple in the informal sense, um, which still has um, these interesting symplectic fillings. Okay, any other questions? So the class of singularities that we focus on are um, called rational surface singularities with reduced fundamental cycle. So this is a, a mouthful. So we kind of abbreviate this by RFC for reduced fundamental cycle. Um, but basically all it, uh, I want you to kind of get out of this is that um, these are singularities with somewhat low complexity from um, a couple of algebraic geometric points of view. So the, the rational part um, is this kind of, uh, uh, yeah, low, lower complexity case. And um, reduced fundamental cycle is kind of like the, and, you know, the fundamental cycle is maybe some other measure of complexity. And um, this is sort of like within rational surface singularities, these are um, kind of the simpler ones. So th these kind of mean uh, low, low complexity from algebraic geometric standpoint. Um, and instead of defining reduced fundamental cycle, um, I'm just going to give a combinatorial um, condition, which uh, turns out to be equivalent to describing the singularities in these classes. Um, in this class, so. Um, we kind of discussed that you can kind of characterize a singularity in terms of its resolution. And the resolution can be encoded by a graph, which describes the plumbing. So if I want to be a singularity um, which lies in this class, reduced fundamental cycle, then my resolution is going to be, um, it has to be a tree. All of the components are going to be genus zero. So I'm not going to label the genus on any of these vertices because they're all just going to be genus zero. Um, and then the, um, the labels, which give my normal Euler numbers or self-intersection numbers. So this, this is like the, the normal Euler number of associated to a vertex. So um, like if this was my vertex V, V dot V would be this minus two. So the, the last condition for this reduced fundamental cycle is that for each vertex, um, the valence of that vertex, the number of edges that um, come out from that vertex um, has to satisfy this inequality in terms of the label on that vertex. So um, like in this example, um, for maybe this vertex, it has a, a minus three and the valency is exactly three. So here my inequality is three. The valence is less than or equal to negative, negative three. So I've got equality there, so that, that's okay. Um, at, at this vertex um, with a negative seven, I have valence one, two, three, four, five. I can count at this time of the morning. Um, five is less than or equal to in this case, the label negated is seven, so that's good. So you can check like all the um, vertices in this graph satisfy the inequality. So, so this, is, this is representing a singularity with reduced fundamental cycle. Um, whereas in the second example, um, I've got a vertex here in the middle. This has valency four. And then the label is only negative three. So the inequality would say four is less than or equal to three, which is not true. Um, so this one um, still represents a singularity as long as um, the graph is negative definite, then um, it still represents a singularity, but um, it, it doesn't count as reduced fundamental cycle. So um, it's kind of easy to come up with to just write down examples of, of graphs which do satisfy this condition. And then you've got tons of examples of singularities of this type.
Where does this condition sort of come from? Well, the reduced fundamental cycle, um, it has to do with you're kind of looking at um, which divisors intersect um, non-negatively with the different components of the resolution. And then you want to say like, what are the, um, what's the kind of smallest with respect to some partial order. Um, and so this um, kind of translates through the intersection form into this condition. Um, this condition shows up in a lot of other places. So like in um, higgard fleur homology, they usually call this like no bad vertices condition. Um, and uh, it kind of just like tends to give a class of Fleming's which have sort of easier properties to, to do calculations with. From a contact and symplectic perspective, um, the contact manifolds that arise on the boundary of these kinds of plumbings um, also have a really nice simplicity property. So this is a result of Gola, Gijini, and Plumnovskaya that um, these singularities are precisely the ones where the contact manifold on the boundary have a planar open book. So um, for contact manifold, um, we have an open book is we've got our, our contact manifold Y. There's gonna be some binding, um, which is a link. And the complement of that link is going to fiber over the circle. And the, the fiber of that vibration is um, some two-dimensional surface F. And um, the planar condition means that that surface is genus zero. So it might have many boundary components, um, but it's a minimal possible genus. And um, planar contact manifolds are nice. Um, from a symplectic perspective, because of um, Wendell's result, that there's um, a way to access the classification of symplectic fillings for a contact manifold supported by a planar open book by just looking at that particular open book and um, finding different factorizations of the monodromy into positive Dane twists. So essentially the result is um, if I have a particular open book decomposition that's planar, then all the symplectic fillings are going to have a Lefschetz vibration structure that fills that particular open book. Whereas in general, you have to look at different stabilizations of the open book um, and it's not, um, it's not reduced to just factorizing one particular element of one map and pass group. Um, so it doesn't mean that we immediately understand all symplectic fillings. Classifying factorizations in the mapping class group is very hard. But um, from, yeah, there, there is still a way in which these singularities are kind of simple and nice from a contact geometric perspective. Okay, so amongst these singularities, we can go back to the question of um, how do their symplectic fillings compare to the uh, things coming from smoothings and resolutions? And so like the previous, the cyclic and quotient singularities that showed up above um, fell into this class. Um, and in those cases, there, there were um, no differences between the symplectic and algebraic geometric stories. Um, but what we prove is that here in the more general class, um, there are differences. So um, if you give me any, um, any int positive integer, um, I can find a, a singularity with a reduced fundamental cycle where there are at least um, that 
number of non diffeomorphic symplectic fillings, um, which uh, we're calling unexpected. So this, this means um, they're, they're different from uh, smoothings and resolutions. And here, different, I'll tell you precisely what it means in the theorem, different means um, not diffeomorphic role boundary. In the previous examples where it was classified, it was up to diffeomorphism or up to symplectomorphism? Well, it's stated as up to symplect or up to diffeomorphism, but if you kind of go back through the proofs, um, you can kind of upgrade it to up to symplectic deformation equivalence. So, I mean, here we're saying like they're different. And, um, and you can see the difference at a pretty coarse level, like at the um, diffeomorphism, at least rel boundary type. So you fix the, the three manifold um, with it's kind of embedded open book decomposition and you just try to say like, what are the different fillings? Um, and we find some which um, some of them do come from Milner fibers and some of them don't. Um, Moreover, we can ensure that these fillings, um, if we pick uh, the right singularity type, um, we can find examples where all the fillings are actually simply connected. So in particular, the first bedding number is trivial. So we're not distinguishing them in the way that um, the Akhmadov Osbachi examples were distinguished from uh, Milner fibers. This is kind of a more subtle distinction uh, between the symplectic fillings and the smoothings. So, you know, they're, they're, the singularities are simple in one sense that they're coming from um, these reduced fundamental cycle case, um, and they have these nice planar open books, but um, they have to have a, at least a little bit of complexity to get up to um, the interesting phenomena occurring. So the, the first case where we find some unexpected fillings um, is with this plumbing graph. Um, so I've got a bunch as kind of central vertex with um, normal Euler number minus 11, and then uh, 10 arms coming out. And all of the vertices in the arms have um, is Euler number minus two. So I didn't write it because there's a lot of them, um, but I've got all these minus two sphere arms um, coming out. And um, so that this case gives uh, one unexpected filling. And then if you want a larger number of unexpected fillings, you get more arms and they get, they get longer. Um, this is maybe a particular specific class um, but it actually generalizes a lot. So as soon as I have um, some unexpected fillings, then I can actually take this graph and augment it by um, adding on more stuff in my graph. So as long as I still satisfy um, the condition of lying in this RFC class, then I can um, take this larger graph, which contains my previous one as a subgraph, and say that this bigger graph has unexpected fillings as well. So um, it's actually like a very large class of singularities where these unexpected fillings occur, even within this um, sort of simple RFC class. Um, you can add on whatever you want to this graph. And as long as you have a bunch of, uh, like a sufficient amount of minus two spheres kind of configured in the right way to begin with, then you can have pretty much whatever you want in the rest of the graph. Okay, any more questions at this point? 
Um, why are these the unexpected ones? <clears throat> so um, we kind of started using unexpected as a sort of informal term um, based on the prior results that um, in previous, well, so I guess like the, the algebraic geometric ones we're, we're sort of thinking of as the expected fillings. Um, and then in the previous results for singularities that were kind of similar to these ones, they didn't have any symplectic fillings um, that differed from the algebraic geometric ones. And so these ones were sort of informally calling unexpected. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so then maybe just as a quick contrast, um, amongst these RFC singularities, so th these cases we had to have a, fairly large number of these minus two spheres showing up um, in, in these chains. Um, what we also showed in the same article is that if we have one of these RFC singularities and the resolution graph has all the vertices where the Euler numbers are um, sufficiently negative, so in the case of um, less than or equal to minus five. So minus twos are out, but um, we also exclude minus threes and minus fours. Then um, the only possible symplectic fillings that you can get are uh, diffeomorphic to the resolution. So uh, there's this kind of mm, dichotomy amongst these RFC singularities where we've got kind of a large class of them that gets um, put in the like no unexpected filling category um, when all the Euler numbers are really negative. And then we've got this pretty large class. Um, if we include enough of these minus two arms in the right way, then they do have unexpected fillings. And there's some space in between, um, but uh, there's sort of a, a, a good amount that, that gets sort of filled up um, by these theorems and the space in between is maybe there are some cases where we can say something, um, but in general it's, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about um, how we uh, approach these kinds of results. So the uh, kind of key to our understanding of what's going on in the algebra geometric side for these types of singularities comes from work of Jung and Van Straten. And so what they did is they looked at the deformation theory. Um, so in particular, understanding the smoothings um, for these types of singularities. Uh, they actually looked at a slightly larger class called sandwich singularities. Um, but that includes these guys. And um, they associated the um, complex smoothings. They found a correspondence um, between the complex smoothings of the complex surface singularity to um, deformations of a certain kind of plane curve singularity. So the surface singularity got associated to a plane curve singularity, and then the deformations of the surface singularity corresponded to um, deformations of the plane curve singularity. So this is a like big advantage um, because originally, if you're trying to understand smoothings of the surface singularity, you're in some like high dimensional space, you're cut out by maybe some large number of polynomials, and, and, and the thing is complex dimension two. Whereas for plane curve singularity, you're just in C2, you have a you know, single polynomial that cuts out your plane curve singularity, and the, you know, the plane curve is just complex dimension one. So its deformation theory is a lot better understood. 
Um, so this is a really useful reduction. So what we showed uh, on the symplectic side is that the symplectic fillings of the links of these kinds of surface singularities correspond in a similar way to um, a kind of deformation of the plane curve singularities that de Jong and Van Straten associated to the surface singularity. Um, but um, in de Jong and Straten's version, their uh, deformations are these kind of complex deformations. Uh, and in our case, um, we're using what we're calling graphical homotopy. So that this is basically treating um, the plane curve singularity as a collection of um, different irreducible components. And um, we can do kind of smooth, uh, smooth homotopies, smooth isotopies or of the different components independently. So they're, they're kind of intersecting each other, smooth homotopies of um, these, these plane curves, plane curve components. So in this um, reduced fundamental cycle case, it turns out that the associated plane curve singularity is, or there, there's an associated plane curve singularity, which has um, only smooth components. Um, and then they, they kind of intersect in different ways. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that association. So basically the unexpected fillings, the symplectic fillings that aren't coming from the algebra geometric side are coming from these kind of curve arrangements, like a way to um, homotopy these curves smoothly um, that we can ob obtain from this kind of graphical homotopy um, that we can't obtain from a complex deformation. So that's the big picture idea. So I want to talk about um, what the plane, how you get the plane curve singularity from the surface singularity. So this is DeYoung and Ben Stratton's um, approach, and uh, in the in the case of our C singularities. So here's here's what you do. You um, start with your resolution graph, which describes your surface singularity. So here I'm going to start with this um, particular graph, minus 6 with some minus 2s hanging off. And then um, this satisfies this kind of valency inequality for RFC singularities. And so what I'm going to do is add some additional um, minus 1 curves, so some exceptional divisors um, along a, a single edge. So they'll intersect a single component of the resolution graph. And um, I'm going to add them in such a way that the whole graph will, in this augmented version, is going to blow down to nothing. So this is basically a way of irrationally embedding the resolution into C2, um, or in other words, it's, it's embedding the resolution into a blow up of C2. So I'm going to find some way so that I can add on these minus one spheres so the whole thing blows down um, to just C2. And um, the fact that I can do this is basically what it means to be a sandwich singularity. And with the RFC singularities, there's a kind of uh, easy, procedure to determine a way to do this, which is you basically want to um, take that valency inequality and make it an equality at um, all the vertices except for one, and in one it will be a little off by one. So like this minus two vertex, um, it had valency one, and so I'm going to add an extra minus one um, vertex to make it valency two. So I do that for each of these uh, minus two guys. And then um, I have one more vertex left. It's a minus six. 
And um, I could add, so I had four original valency, so I'm going to add one more. So that's um, valency five. And um, if I added one more to valency six, I'd get a quality, um, but I'm going to kind of delete the last one that I would have added. And um, that uh, ensures you can kind of convince yourself by doing enough examples um, that this thing will, will blow down to nothing. So in this case, we, um, I'm going to take this graph and, and make the dual picture. So now instead of a vertex representing each exceptional divisor, I'm going to um, represent it by a curve. So I've got my minus six curve, my four minus two curves, my five minus one curves. And then I'm going to add on um, a little arrow, a green arrow onto the end of each of the minus one curves. And what these arrows represent is um, a little meridional disk that's transverse to um, my minus one curves. And basically the idea is like I started with my, my resolution and then I added on um, these kind of exceptional divisors and I'm going to take a little disk that transversely intersects that um, exceptional divisor. And um, if I take the complement of a neighborhood of that disk, I kind of cut that out, then that pierces a hole in this exceptional divisor. And so that will retract um, back down onto my original resolution graph. So if I delete, um, these the disks corresponding to these little arrows, um, then I get back to um, the kind of the thing that I started with. So I'm going to keep track of these and and start blowing down. So I'll first blow down all the red minus one curves. That gets me um, from the first picture to the second picture. And I'm going to kind of bring the intersect the the arrows along with it. So. As I blow down a minus one curve, it causes the adjacent curves to intersect transversely. Um, and then I have some new minus one curves. So I'll blow them down, carry the arrows along with it. And then finally, this um, central curve becomes a minus one and I can blow it down. And then it's gonna bring all these arrows um, to intersect transversely at a single point. And so now I'm in C2, and these arrows, which were little disks, um, they become um, curves inside of um, a, a ball inside of C2. So I've got a singular point and the, the germ of a plane curve singularity at that point. Um, and I keep track of, so these numbers on the arrows um, these are, we're calling them, we call them weights or Alan Tratton call them weights. I don't actually remember. Um, but these keep track of the number of blowdowns that the arrow was involved in. So if I like track this arrow, it went through one blowdown at this stage. So now it has a label of one and then it goes through another blowdown. So it gets a label of two and then it goes through a third blowdown and it gets a label of three. Um, and so most of them had that procedure. And then um, this, this other one um, only got blown down uh, kind of that one time and, and then it gets blown down at the end. So it gets a, a weight of two. I keep track of these weights and the arrows give us our plane curve singularity. Um, this is another kind of quick example that has a little bit different behavior. Um, so if I blow down um, my minus one curves here, then my arrows um, get weight one. I have a new minus one curve, which I blow down, causes the arrows to intersect transversely and their weights increase. And then I blow down an exceptional divisor, which passes through that transverse intersection. And that brings the transverse intersection to a tangency. So I get this kind of simple tangency, um, and that's my plane curve singularity, the germ of my plane curve singularity. 
Um, and then I keep track of these weights as well. So that's the kind of de Young construction data um, that I associate to my singularity. So what is the de Young Schratten procedure for understanding the smoothings? I start out with this um, plane curve singular germ. And I'm going to do complex deformations of that plane curve um, in, so that after the deformation, the um, components of the curve have only transverse intersections. So, and then um, our symplectic analog is similar. So we allow um, graphical homotopies of the singular plane curve so that at the end of the homotopy, they only have um, transverse intersections. And then there's also a, a weight condition, which is easier to explain with an example. Um, so we kind of have these very analogous results. It's just our notion of what can happen during the deformation is different. Um, so here's um, for this kind of simple example, if we had um, these components which were tangent to each other, then we can do a deformation to turn the tangency into two transverse intersections. This was a simple tangency, so multiplicity two tangency and it becomes two transverse intersections. And then the weight condition, each of these curves has this weight. Um, and I want to basically, so if this curve has weight three, I want to have three dots drawn on this curve. So the rule is every intersection, every transverse intersection point has to have a dot. And then if I haven't reached the weight, limit yet, then I can add more dots at kind of free points. Um, so this is a, a kind of legitimate deformation uh, endpoint where I get transverse intersections and I realize this weight condition. Um, for the other example that we had, um, the end point of the plane curve singularity was just a bunch of already transversely intersecting curves. So I can kind of do a deformation that really doesn't change that at all. So they're already transverse, so I can just keep them transverse. And then I just um, make sure that I have, there's only one intersection point that needs to be marked. And then I add extra um, free points to realize the weights. So that's one um, deformation that's allowed. Um, but another end point of the deformation that's allowed is something like this. So here's another configuration of um, curves where they transversely intersect. Um, each pair transversely intersects once. And um, if I mark all the intersection points, then say this curve has three intersection points and that's corresponding to weight three, so that's good. Um, this component has three intersection points, weight three. This um, horizontal component has uh, two intersection points and weight two, and then the other guys have um, three intersection points, corresponds to weight three. So this is okay. Um, one thing that would violate the weight condition is if I tried to deform this to a generic arrangement where all the lines intersect um, at different points, then if I have my weights, three, three, two, three, three, I've got a problem because on each of the components, I have four intersection points, which exceeds the weight limit. So um, this, is, this is not allowed as a deformation. 
And these weights are, are kind of like keeping track of the, um, there's not really a normal Euler number or self-intersection number of these curves because they're just open terms, but um, it's, it's kind of keeping track of that in a sense. What is really keeping track of um, is the number of, of blow downs that occurred to the curve. And so what we're gonna see is that we're gonna do the same number of blow ups to, um, to reverse this, um, the blow downs that we did when we produced the singular curve to begin with. And those blow ups are what we're going to need in order to get, construct the symplectic fillings from um, this curve arrangement. Any questions at this point? So it's completely legal to have a bunch of like if if you if, theoretically if you had another example where you seem to have too many intersections, would you also be able to like do this trick of making things intersect in one point and then just manually reducing intersections like that? Um, so there is always there always exists a deformation. Um, so basically the the way that the weights relate to the orders of tangency, there's always at least one deformation where you're kind of like using the intersections most efficiently. Um, so like when they're all transversely intersecting, you, you can always kind of do this thing where they all intersect at a point. When you have tangencies, you have to have you know, multiple transverse intersections to account for the multiplicity of the tangency. Um, but the weights, uh, kind of the way that they're constructed they automatically um, satisfy an inequality that ensures that there exists at least one allowable deformation. Cool. Um, but there might not be more than one. Yeah, okay, so where do we get symplectic fillings? So we've got this um, plane curve arrangement sitting inside of C2. And so this, this is my Curly C denotes my plane curve. Uh, and I'm gonna let it be the, the deformed version. And it could be deformed by a complex deformation or um, by a graphical homotopy. So the, the graphical part means um, I have a standard projection from C2 to C, I just project to one coordinate. And um, without loss of generality, kind of choosing coordinates, um, I have a finite number of tangent directions for these curves. So I'm just going to pick um, my coordinates so that all of my components um, were graphical in the original singular version. And I'll do my deformation small enough so that they, they stay graphical. Um, so I've got these um, components. And with respect to this projection, the fibers of the projection are um, you know, just a, a copy of C. And the intersection of each of these copies of C with the um, deformed plane curve um, generically will be um, a number of points corresponding to the number of components of that plane curve. And um, non-generically, when I get to a um, fiber which contains an intersection point, a transverse intersection point of um, my plane curve, then some of those points come together and collide. Um, so I have a smaller number of points. So this is, if I look at the complement of um, these curves, it's not really a vibration um, because of the, the points coming together, but I can, um, fix this issue of the points and coming together and intersecting at a point um, by blowing up. So I'm going to um, go over to the blow up. I'm going to blow up um, at the marked points. So my marked points included all the transverse intersections and maybe a few other free points. And so in the blow up, um, the transverse intersections become disjoint from each other. So um, I get these 
I mean, th this was the one I was focused on. Here's a new exceptional divisor. And then the three curves that passed through um, separate out from each other. And so now I can project, um, kind of compose the blowdown with the projection down to C. And um, I have a, a new um, a new map. And this map I'm claiming if I take the complement, I'm going to delete um, the strict transform of my plane curve. Uh, or maybe a, a neighborhood of the strict transform. Um, when I delete that, then um, and restrict the map, then the resulting map is actually a leftist vibration. So a generic fiber is the same as before. It just um, is a, a copy of C with some points removed or maybe disks removed if I remove the neighborhood. Um, and then my exceptional fibers, um, where I had the intersection points, I now get um, my exceptional divisor contained in there. And um, the different components, the different holes, um, the ones that didn't pass through the intersection kind of stay in the normal part of the fiber. And the ones that did pass through the intersection, um, they move into the exceptional divisor. And so if you look at the you know, formulas for blowups, um, you can see that the type of singularity that occurs um, when you blow up this um, standard uh, projection C2 to C are exactly leftist type singularities. Um, so as long as we, we are piercing at least one of these, then it's an allowable leftist vibration. OK, so we have a leftist vibration. The generic fiber is, um, is planar. It's a plane with holes in it. Um, and uh, we take a kind of compact version. So instead of C, we've intersected everything with sort of a large ball or a large disk time disk. And um, so we've got a kind of compact uh, thing with, um, with boundary. And um, these give our um, symplectic fillings and Milner fibers. So um, Dion and Stratton um, kind of describe a similar procedure of blowing up and taking the complement um, of the complex deformations to find Milner fibers. And when we do this um, more generally for any graphical homotopy, um, we still get the left shift vibration. So we still get a symplectic filling. So then the last um, thing to look for the differences between the symplectic and um, complex objects is um, to look for appropriate curve configurations um, that don't show up as complex deformations. So here's one example. Um, we start out with an, a plane curve singularity where we do have a bunch of um, transversely intersecting components. And there are some weights, which I'm not labeling here, but um, this whatever I draw here is going to satisfy the weight condition. Um, and so if I look at this particular kind of configuration of curves, the black, the set of black curves, which pass through intersection points in this sort of way that capital ABC and little ABC, and they crisscross in this particular way, then there's a classical um, projective geometry theorem, uh, it's Pappas theorem, which says that um, there's these kind of three points where some of these lines, these black lines intersect, which are automatically collinear. So you wouldn't have really necessarily expected three random points to be collinear, but no matter how you draw this, as long as it satisfies these incidence relations, um, a, a line configuration um, is going to have these three points lie on the same line. So you can do, you can find a symplectic version of this line arrangement or just a smooth version um, where you 
take a, a line that passes through the first two points, um, but then you just push it so that it doesn't intersect the third point. Um, and so it kind of misses the point that it's supposed to go to. And then um, we actually have to kind of pin it down um, somewhere else, pin its intersection with one of these lines somewhere else. And that's why we add in this kind of extra blue line. So to really distinguish this from something coming from a complex deformation, um, we have to do this kind of pinning down in some way. And um, so then what we prove is this particular configuration, um, it can be obtained from our graphical homotopy. We can kind of push these lines around, staying graphical to get to this um, type of incidence configuration. But there's no um, complex analytic deformation, which would lead to a configuration with the same incidence configuration. And then the incidences of um, the curves at the end of the deformation um, translates to information about the diffeomorphism type rel boundary of the symplectic filling. And so that's how we distinguish um, the symplectic filling that corresponds to this configuration from um, Milner fibers uh, or smoothings that come, um, that arise uh, from complex deformations. So that's the idea. I'll maybe just end by showing you one more picture of a, of a configuration that arises from a graphical homotopy that's not a complex deformation um, that kind of again uses this trick in a slightly different way um, from a different protective geometry theorem to differentiate um, the arrangement from something that shows up complex complex algebraically. Um, so yeah, I'll open it up for questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions for us, please? I have a silly one maybe. Um, I know I've referred you a lot today, but still, uh, you mentioned that uh, a, a way, an easy, sort of an easy way to verify something is not a smoothing is to say B1 is positive. Um, is there like a trick like that for resolutions or is it more complicated? Um, so for resolutions, because we kind of understand exactly what the resolutions are, um, so here, the, the Stein fillings that we're getting, the leftist vibrations, um, are minimal. And there's a unique minimal uh, normal crossing resolution. So, um, so for one thing, it's like there's only one thing that we have to compare it to. Um, so that's easier. The other thing that's actually easier in this setting is that the resolution in this case is actually, it, it deforms. Uh, there's a symplectic deformation to something that's actually a smoothing. And it's that it, it's the smoothing that corresponds to that kind of most efficient um, curve configuration where you like with this transverse case, they all intersect at a single point. So there's this kind of like special smoothing, um, which is basically the, the resolution, um, at least the different morphism types are the same. Um, and and so we don't have to really worry about the resolution as a separate case because of that. Thank you. But yeah, good question. Uh, I have the following question. So in, in this story with Papus theorem, so when you say that the feeling which you get is different from complex feeling, which invariant are you using exactly? So. That's the thing. We're not really using an invariant. Um, we're basically using this Jan van Straten classification of the um, of the smoothings to say if it was diffeomorphic to a smoothing, uh, the smoothing would have corresponded to some complex deformation, and that complex deformation would have had to have this kind of incidence relation. 
And anything with this kind of incidence relation, um, we rule out that it, like it can't come from a from a complex deformation. So we're not detecting things with an invariant. We're kind of just looking at like a one to one comparison of the symplectic objects to the complex objects using these curve configurations. Uh, can some gromov witten invariant uh, help in this situation since you're kind of counting certain curves in non-standard position, maybe? Mm, possibly. Maybe, maybe another thing to say is like, uh, in a sense, like we are using invariants that are just like basic algebraic topology invariants, um, like the Betty numbers are different. Um, so that mm -hmm. they're different from the Milner fiber um just at the uh, basic algebraic topology level um but like to say that to say what properties the um the Mil what algebraic topology the milner fibers have we have to kind of use this Dion von Straten. it's it's possible that there are some more sim subtle um symplectic invariants out there um that can detect something um but in dimension four, it's like for the symplectic, for gromov witten invariants to say something different than the smooth topology is maybe not expected. Um, I mean, this is not the closed case, so we don't exactly have like gromov witten equals cyberg witten um, but it's, it's hard to find examples of four manifolds where they're, the symplectic invariants can say anything that the smooth invariants can't. I see. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. well, if there are no more questions, I'm going to thank the speaker again.